Happy October, everyone. This is the month of Halloween, and the perfect time to sit down and enjoy some scary entertainment. The slasher flicks, the haunted house stories, the creature features, election coverage, all totally terrifying things sure to chill you to the bones and make the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. Ridley Scott's original film, Alien, has always been a favorite of the season, usually enjoying October revivals, such as the 2003 director's cut, and as recently as last year, an October re-release, celebrating its 40th anniversary. More often than not, Alien is included on just about any list of essential horror movies worth watching. So, where does that leave the James Cameron sequel, Aliens? While it practiced a bit of a genre shift, leaning more towards becoming an action film, it's certainly a scary experience, and undoubtedly a top-tier creature feature. If the big chap of the original film has gone down as one of cinema's most notorious monsters, then surely the big bad bitch, the Queen, of Cameron's sequel isn't too far behind, and an iconic creation in and of itself. It would be hard to chastise anyone for including Aliens in an October horror movie marathon. It always delivers the goods when it comes to thrills and chills, but of course, not everyone holds the film in a high regard. Around this time last year, I decided to venture into the spookiest corner of the internet, the user comment section of the Internet Movie Database, and scare up some of the most negative reviews of the original film. This year, I'll be doing the same for the sequel. After all, it seems to have a very similar reputation as the first, mostly receiving wide acclaim, mostly. As it currently stands, Aliens is ranked at number 73 of IMDb's best rated movies of all time. This is based on about 642,000 votes. Currently, there are 1,314 user reviews submitted for the film, 619 of which have awarded the film with a perfect 10 out of 10 rating. That's pretty strong praise, but not everyone's a fan, and currently there are 4,291 votes of the lowest score possible, a 1. And of those, there are currently 15 one-star user-submitted reviews. In going through these, I've seen that there's one duplicated review, so more like 14, but still 14 too much, I say. But like last year, I really have to stress that this is all just in good fun. Let's not hold any ill will toward any of these reviewers. Everyone's entitled to their opinion, and a site such as IMDb makes it possible for people from all over the world to have a widely accessible platform to share that opinion. This is all for kicks, this is just for amusement, so let's take a look. We'll be going over these in chronological order by date of submission, beginning as early as 15 years ago, and as recently as just three months ago. These are the one-star user reviews of Aliens on the Internet Movie Database. The first review is from June of 2005 by a user named MWB1005. The title of the review is a little misleading, or I guess maybe sarcastic, stating, I love this movie. Let's see where the love is lost. This is what MWB1005 had to say. Warning spoilers. Of course, this contains spoilers. I used to love this movie. It was one of my favorites, top five even. I loved the lines like, God damn you, Burke, or Game Over. I saw this movie less than a week ago after a long waiting period. It is horrible. We lag on for about 45 minutes before we even get to the planet. In doing that, we hear all of these lame lines. You can see a James Cameron line coming a mile away. The guy writes lines he wants people to quote, he doesn't actually write. 1. Hey man, all I gotta know is where they are. 2. Vasquez, you're just too bad. High five. What? How stupid can people be? I'm not talking about the people who actually enjoy it, I'm talking about these horrible marines. What kind of lines are these? Do people actually train like this in the future? Oh no. Again, about the lagging. James Cameron, you bastard. You put a dream sequence of an alien, really crappy quality too, popping out of Ripley's chest to keep us appeased for an hour? When we do see the aliens, all they are are mindless drones, ants. The alien was not an ant. An ant cannot survive by itself. The alien was smart, fast, and scary. Yet, we hardly saw him. I hate you, James Cameron. You are boring. Ha ha ha, laughs the Black Sergeant. 
A girl can drive a machine. She can move a joystick and her feet. This scene is so pointless, but of course, not. How could we believe she could kill that big-ass queen slash pause? Why did Ripley go for the eggs and queen when the reactor was going to wipe them out anyway? Ripley's stupid action, well, Cameron's stupid writing, cost Bishop his torso. She calls the queen a bitch? Hey, she destroyed her kids. Why shouldn't the queen kill a frog? Oh, sorry, Newt. Oh, I get it. Cameron wanted more action. Ho, 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 JC. You're good. Unpause. Without us, the viewers, knowing that she could use that machine. Oh, Jim, you're a genius. Bill Paxton, you are horrible. I liked the spacecraft in the beginning, but I've seen the effect in 2001 much better, too. Oh, and Star Wars pulled it off with lots of ships. So wait, I've changed my mind. Cameron is again an original. Just watch this movie. Listen to the dialogue. Yes, I know how to spell, but IMDB won't let me add the UE. I'm going to watch every other Cameron flick I own, and then probably sell a copy to one of you that gives my review a thumb down. Trey Benton. A lot of ground is covered here. A very interesting train of thought is followed, and we're all along for the wild ride. First things first, though, my impression here is that, yes, at one point, this person, Trey, did actually really love the movie. But after however long of a period of having not watched it, revisited it in 2005 and felt it did not live up to the initial praise they had once given it. That happens, of course. There have been plenty of movies that I've seen when I was younger, then only to watch them a little bit later, realizing they're just not my taste anymore. I'm sure that's happened to you as well, at some point, with some movie or movies over the course of your life, maybe even going back and forth as to whether you like it or not. But I have to admit, it's a huge dip in once claiming it to be in your top five movies of all time to hitting that nuclear option of a one-star rating. Trey used to love the lines and the dialogue, in particular from the Marines in the film, but now finds it hackneyed, finds it to be more of a case of James Cameron coming up with all these lines and then surrounding them with a movie as an afterthought. There are qualms about how the Marines act. I don't think necessarily this is meant to be an entirely realistic view of what the military in the future would be, but very much so the movie version of it. In getting his ideas for Aliens, James Cameron watched a lot of war movies, observed a lot of the jargon and the interactions between the soldiers in those movies, and lent that spirit to Aliens. I think it works great, and I think the lines are great, and I know many fans would agree with that, but I don't really know if it's a matter of this reviewer simply not liking the lines specifically, or not liking them in general because they're not exactly all realistic. And I think in contrasting that to Alien, the original film, it's a fair enough point to make. The dialogue in Alien is very natural. A lot of it is ad-libbed and feels very realistic in the situation. While with Aliens, there's more constriction to the lines and getting the plot moving along and all the quotable gems along the way. So it is a jarring difference between the movies, and I could understand how that may not work for some viewers. He makes a complaint about the lagging, which was a prominent criticism of the first film in the video I made about the negative reviews of Alien. Hardly seems worth addressing. It's building up the atmosphere, creating tension, letting you into this world and its characters. But I guess if someone hates the characters already, then yeah, it's not going to pay off for the viewer. One complaint here that I've noticed to be a prominent criticism of the movie, not necessarily of these reviews, but in general, over the years since its release, is that the alien creature itself is demystified in a way by making the xenomorph more insect-like. For sure, the original Alien borrows heavily from real-life insect life cycles, but it's employed here even further. With the hive, maybe it's like an anthive, and the drones, and the queen. I appreciate that criticism, and in some ways I agree with it. The aliens here aren't as mysterious as the original Big Chap, but they remain a unique and unpredictable creature nevertheless. And for sure, have intelligence beyond mindless drones working on instinct. They know enough to cut the power, one seems to know enough to sneak aboard the dropship and kill Spunkmire and Pharaoh, thwarting the chances for escape. And the Queen is definitely intelligent, enough to know how to operate that elevator. And as for the Queen, she doesn't just instinctively defend her hive, but actively seeks out revenge on Ripley for destroying it. Vengeance certainly is not a characteristic you'd see in any run-of-the-mill insect. 
But all of these points are moot, I think, because this reviewer, with a goofy, semi-sarcastic summation of the film, just had to cross the line. Calling Bill Paxton horrible. You don't do that. Say whatever you want about James Cameron, but you don't say a bad word about Bill Paxton. He is the greatest, and you can't change my mind on that. Completely unacceptable. For shame. So, let's move on. This next review is titled, Not Even Half of the First One, by user DDFCMP8, from June of 2006. Warning, spoilers. I'm sorry to have to disagree with about 90% of this website, but I did not find this sequel to be anything but a rehash of the first. Not only is it a rehash, but also brought to life some of the really dumb stereotypes that exist in movies today. Crummy dialogue that is fixed to sound cool and awesome, or in with the times. And you know what? It isn't. Now, before you dismiss the rest of my review, I want to add that I tried to like this film. For a long while, I tried to find some cool ways to see it, and you know what? I thought I had for a while. But you know, the thing is that so many people hold it up higher than the first, and I just can't see why. I guess I would be open to give it a second chance, but people keep saying it is better than the first, and I just don't agree. I think the opening was alright, until the shock sequence when, uh-oh, she might have something in her stomach and, oh, just a dream. How cheap. Why would they even rely that much on the first, especially since it had been a good six or seven years already? Jeez. I just thought that was mistake number one. Next, the film was quite intriguing, but that was because they discussed the original's damages. I just can't say when I lost it. Most of Sigourney's dialogue was pretty awesome, and of course, Sigourney was great. I'll give it that, but the rest, it just seems too imposed and buffed, and for what? It just crashes into all the rocks on LV-426. Oops, there's another problem right there. They just have to bring us to the scene of the crime. And 57 years later. Ugh! Why not have the original beast find its way to Earth? Why not make a new type of disaster happen? Taking back to the original scene of the crime was unnecessary. My final word is that this film needn't have been made, but it was, and I watched, actually think it would be good. It could have, and should have been, but I just don't think it was. How do you follow the act of the original Ridley Scott classic? You don't. Sorry. Already, you can kind of begin to see a pattern here. Those who don't like the film seem to take issue with the dialogue, the lines from the Marines, maybe feel it's trying too hard, and for whatever reason that dream sequence at the beginning of the film is quite unloved. Personally, I think it's a great sequence, and I think it's done in a really clever way. By including this scene as a dream, it's able to cover important ground with the Ripley character, and also, of course, get a good scare that sets up the tone of the movie. We learn in this scene that Ripley has been asleep for 57 years, which gets the exposition of the plot out of the way, but we also learn a trait of this character is that she's now haunted by recurring dreams of the alien. And of course, looking at it in a certain context, upon its first release, audiences, I'm sure, were suspicious that in returning for a second film, Ripley might have had an alien inside her. So it delivers on that, without really delivering on it, but still giving the audience something that they would have been expecting. And it both delivers on that suspicion, but it also sets it aside, removing it from the possible plot points the sequel would explore. So we learn more of the plot, we learn more of the character, we get a good scare. I think it's handled well. You can call it a fake-out if you want, and sure, it is in a way, but it's done with purpose, I think. I can't really rag on this review all too much. It seems sincere enough. It's not trying to be a smarmy, over-the-top comedy act or anything like that. The reviewer actually seems legitimately disappointed that they just couldn't see what other people saw in the movie. And that's fine. Not everyone who loves the first film is going to love this sequel, though it does have similar traits. It follows the structure enough to have a certain kind of bond with the first. Enough, I suppose, to be seen as a rehash in some viewers' eyes. I wouldn't go that far, and I have a hard time understanding why a review that seems to express a reasonable amount of disappointment would go so far as to give it the one-star rating. But that just seems to be how it goes on the site. It's always about extremes. If it's not a 1 or a 10, no one seems to pay attention. As for the complaint about returning to the scene of the crime, that's certainly something I can appreciate, but I guess that aspect hinges on the Ripley character in some ways. 
Going into any concept of an alien sequel, probably one of the first questions in approaching it is, do we continue following the survivor of the first film? And that's what they do here. So you could almost envision some kind of concept of a sequel without the Ripley character, where, say, an entirely new crew of an entirely new ship also sits down on LV-426, then you get a genuine rehash of the first film. Because of the origin of the alien being mysterious in so many ways, and also hinging on that derelict ship, it almost seems impossible that any kind of sequel wouldn't have revisited it. So that's at least done here in what I would call a plausible way. Time has passed, LV-426 has been colonized, it's all lying in wait, but it's Ripley who seems to be the missing piece of the puzzle. She's the only one with the exact coordinates of the derelict ship, and that's what they follow through with. I can buy that. Better than I probably could in seeing a brand new alien ship, or having the alien hidden in the cat the entire time, which I'm sure a lot of people may have been expecting going into the sequel as well. It's the same location, but it's done in an entirely different way, and I applaud the steps Cameron took in establishing all of that. But sure, I'd also like to see something different. I'd like to see what could be done if we bring the aliens to Earth, as we've seen in the comics, and I think there's still opportunity for that in future movies. And just for argument's sake, let's exclude the Alien vs. Predator movies and what they did on Earth. But I don't think taking this route devalues the story in any way for aliens. But no hard feelings for this reviewer. They tried to like it. They sincerely tried, but they just couldn't. This next review is from November of 2006, from CC the Movie Man 1, titled One Alien Was Enough. Here's what CC the Movie Man has to say. The first of these movie, Alien, is in my DVD collection, but not the rest, beginning with this sequel. I'm sorry, but having low-life people portrayed as astronauts is ludicrous and insulting. I put up with it in Alien, but it's even worse in this film, beginning with Sigourney Weaver's character who is extremely profane and butch-like in her macho feminist overdone characterization. Who cares about scary aliens when the supposed good guys are this sleazy? The cast fits the scummy people perfectly, as these actors are known for these kind of roles. It's just another in a line of films directed by James Cameron that features scumbags as the lead characters. Of course, the sick critics loved it. Figures. Uh, this one's a little strange. I'm not exactly sure why this reviewer believes the characters to be sleazy or scummy. Maybe it's the lines, maybe it's some coarse language, I can't say for sure. But I think an appeal in the first two movies is that it's about people in certain professions, whether it be the space truckers of the first or the marines of this sequel, dealing with a situation completely beyond their preparation. They have a certain set of rules and protocols, but when the unprecedented situation unfolds and the true horror of the alien threat becomes realized, none of these rules can save them. There's no training, no protocol, no safety net for this kind of event. Despite whatever their occupation may be and how professional they may or may not act within it, they are human. They're still regular people, they're fallible, and much of their true colors begin to show within a crisis situation. You see certain characters stepping up, others panicking, there's heated discussions, there's teamwork despite everyone's differences, but it's still all about ordinary people and extraordinary circumstances. And I think it was a clever move on the part of the sequel to introduce the Marines, the trained combat professionals that one may assume would fare better than the average working Joes of the first film, but they don't. Not really. The outcome is equally dire. So, for whatever reason, CC the Movie Man sees them as scumbags and characters that aren't worth rooting for. I can only imagine what he may think of the third film filled with rapists and murderers. Or maybe he skipped that one. This next review is from user Ignatio-Mig14 from August 2012, with the title, Hey Jim, what have you done to my Ripley? Warning, spoilers. I usually like James Cameron movies, more than any Scorsese or Spielberg's actually, but this sequel just hurts me real bad. In Ridley Scott's movie, Ripley was a sexy heroine fighting with no massive weapons who didn't cry for dead daughters or any of those dumb sentimental cliches that most people love, but I don't. She was alone and fought. Even her ship partners didn't care for her. She was a horror survivor. Well, Mr. Cameron thought that was all wrong. He thought Scott was portraying Ripley as a heartless and useless person, I assume, so he equipped her with the biggest machine gun out there, packed with infinite ammo, 
so violence lovers can drool just staring at it, and she only had to shoot. And he added a little girl to replace a coming-out-of-nowhere-dead daughter, bravo, and wants me to cheer for the girl, cry for the girl, and love the girl while she screams like being possessed by a really high-pitched voice demon. Terrific. Well, I didn't do any of that. Instead, I've started to hate her and the movie, and that's what I'm still doing. Along with the little girl, Cameron wants me to cheer for more cute people. The US Army. Cool. Let's say some people were living on the dead planet, so we send the army in order to save them and save the day for the country. Well, I'm not American, so I can't have any good feelings about their army. I'm sorry. I'd rather watch Avatar, anytime. At least Jim wants me to cheer for the right people on that one. Finally, while the alien in Scott's 1979 masterpiece was a force of nature that nobody could kill, here Karen introduces us a bunch of boring bugs that can be killed easier than an ant. Just for the sake of appreciate all the weaponry and all the shooting. For that, I'd rather watch Terminator. I find this sequel appalling. It destroyed the planet built by Mr. Scott, flooding it with the more basic cliches a movie can have. I hate this movie, and especially the annoying little girl. Oh, and the end. A shameless ripoff. One out of ten, because there's no zero out of ten. So here we have a reviewer yet again not too keen on the action direction the sequel takes, which also seems to be a pattern. The main gripe being how the Ripley character was handled and changed her in some way. I disagree with that. I think it's still the same character we know from the first film, but more is added to her. I liked how they added a personal backstory with her daughter and finding the connection to Newt, but clearly this reviewer wants none of that. But come on, how could you hate Newt so much? Newt's great. Leave her alone. There also seems to be an accusation by including the military in this story that it leans towards some kind of jingoism, which I also strongly disagree with. This isn't some flag-waving be-all-you-can-be propaganda or something. In fact, I think it's just the opposite. If anything, it's more of a deterrent. They're pawns in a larger corporate scheme, they're completely expendable, and they're left completely on their own amidst all this madness. It doesn't seem like much of a glorification of the military to me. It's not an endorsement of the military, nor is it necessarily a damnation of it either, but more of an exercise in showing what can and will go wrong when they're serving corporate interests. And in going back to some of the comments on the previous review I made, when you watch something like Alien, you may think in the back of your head, well, hey, if these were a group of trained combat professionals, if they had advanced weaponry, maybe the alien wouldn't be so much of a threat. Aliens takes that musing and puts it right in the spotlight for this film, and proves that not to be the case, which it executes perfectly. But that's just me, I guess. Obviously, this reviewer has other ideas. This next review is from a user named Donald King from the 1st of January, 2013. The title of this review is Moronic Sequel to Alien. Warning Spoilers Ridley Scott once made a brilliant sci-fi film called Alien. Many years later, he made an equally brilliant prequel called Prometheus. In the years between, people tried to make their own sequels. One of these people was a man called James Cameron. First, he decided to make his version sentimental by introducing an irritating child that kept screaming so Ripley could say dumb things to reassure it. Fortunately, David Fincher had the brat killed off in time for his version. Cameron also decided he would have the film dominated by a group of U.S. Marines. These Marines were to have a combined IQ of about minus five. All the Marines said things like, let's go, and oh my god, what is that? Most irritating of all was Bill Paxton. Shame on you. He ended every sentence with the word man. Fortunately for the viewer, the aliens soon disemboweled him. The heroine of the film was to be given lines just as bad as the Marines. The aliens were not scary, no matter how many there were. The spaceships looked second-hand. After an hour of this Farago, one's eyelids began to close. The Marines shot at the aliens with their huge weaponry. Lance Henriksen got his head blown off, but carried on talking. Happily, when the Marines were killed, death applied to their tonsils, too. After this success, Mr. Cameron got to make a three-hour-long film about a ship that was perfectly designed. It sank. Oh my god, what's with the Newt hate? Do people really hate Newt that much? I mean, there's a wide range of child actors in movies like this that are on a spectrum of totally fitting to teeth-grindingly annoying, and Newt is nowhere close to that annoying level, in my opinion. 
But whatever, this reviewer clearly feels she's on that side of the spectrum. According to this reviewer, the movie's too sentimental. The lines are bad, the aliens aren't scary, and the spaceships are not convincing. The complaint about the lines seems to come up repeatedly, doesn't it? Those who hate the movie really seem to hate its dialogue. Also, we have another Paxton offender here, so this guy's opinion doesn't matter. Bill Paxton's the greatest, man. Shame on you, man. This next review is from October 2016 from a user named Very Kermode. The title is A Mindless Shoot 'em Up. Warning, spoilers. If only Aliens were a horror movie as Alien and its true sequel, Alien 3 are. This mindless shoot 'em up with its TV formatted aspect ratio is clearly the black sheep of the original trilogy. It is enjoyable, yes, but as an Alien film, it definitely doesn't cut it. Perhaps they should have given the project to Stallone or Schwarzenegger and waited until they had drawn up a script that would have fitted the criteria set by the first movie. We have James Cameron to blame for clearly not understanding that classy horror films should not be about macho gun-wielding Rambo antics and people admiring and greasing up each other's muscles. Thank goodness Alien 3 restored the franchise to its bleak and artistic horror roots. In even the most limited interactions with fans of the Alien franchise, you'll probably notice the majority of fans feel that the third film is where they drop the ball and that generally Alien 3 is a lesser film than the first two. However, there are certainly fans who believe that it was Aliens that was the misstep and Alien 3 was the true return to form, keeping in with the tone and atmosphere of the original movie. It is a rarer breed of fan, but they are out there. While Aliens introduces action into the series, I'd hardly call it a mindless shoot 'em up though, and I'd say the claims that it's wall-to-wall -wall action is an exaggeration. There's a clear distinction between something like Commando or Rambo or, well, Predator, and a movie like Aliens. I'd say it's more akin to a war drama, something like Platoon or Apocalypse Now, where the action and gunfire isn't something to revel in and enjoy, but more frantic and gruesome and, quite honestly, scary. Sigourney's not winking at the camera with one-liners or anything like that. She's not tailored to be some female equivalent to the muscle-bound action stars of the 80s, which many accuse her of being. That's just not the case. That's an exaggerated view, I feel. But there is an interesting criticism here, something not brought up too much, but an undeniable factor that leads aliens to being indeed the odd one out in the series. The black sheep, as this reviewer pegs it. He mentions the aspect ratio of the film, which is in fact different than literally every other film in the franchise, from the original four to the prequels and even the Alien vs. Predator movies. All were filmed in a 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio, a much wider ratio compared to Aliens, which was filmed in the 1.85 to 1 aspect ratio. If you're a complete stickler for a visual continuity between films, then maybe this is an irritating inconsistency? Is it worth rating a one star though? I wouldn't say so, but maybe at least worth mentioning. And I guess it's enough for this reviewer to say that Aliens doesn't quite cut it as an alien film. This next review from April 2017 is titled Unpopular Opinion from the user iSkywalking. Warning, spoilers. Words cannot describe just how much I hate this piece of expletive sequel to one of the greatest films of all time. This film breaks every single one of my personal cardinal rules for what makes a great film, so I'll begin my rant. Right from the get-go, it is evident that James Cameron's intent is on taking the subtleties and atmosphere of the first film, two things that made the original so amazing, and turn it on its head. Every single cliché you can possibly muster up is used in this filth. Sorry, I meant film. Melodramatic and extremely over-the-top dialogue, scenarios and acting all rolled into one. So within the first 15 minutes, with zero build-up or development, Ripley is back and has a deep understanding of the aliens miraculously, as if her situation in the original has turned her into an expert on these aliens all of a sudden. They also now have boatloads of crews on the planet with the ship and have colonized it. Of course, the people on site consist of all kinds of jokers and utter morons and, um, children? Okay, I guess because families, or whatever. Moving along, there is absolutely no suspense or build-up in any way, shape, or form, like the original brilliantly had. 
Now they are seemingly surrounded by hundreds of aliens, and the stupidity begins to overlap one another. Over-the-top performances by everyone, absolutely cringeworthy dialogue, and humor, and wisecracks. In one scene, a crowd is standing and staring at an object barreling towards them with plenty of time to move, yet they all stand and stare, until good old Ripley notified everyone to run. Because apparently seeing the object coming towards them wasn't enough to garner a reaction. But our alien expert hero telling them not to get hit by oncoming traffic seemed to do the trick. In another scene during a gunfight with the aliens, one super duper badass commando doesn't just shoot an alien in the face, he manages to have just enough time to stick the barrel in the alien's face. Have the alien not react for a few seconds so the totally badass commando looking dude could say, eat this, before he pulled the trigger. Super duper gnarly. Rock on bros. Kick ass. USA. USA. Then we have the old innocent child caught up in the midst of this alien war trick. Oh, whatever will they do. I hope this object, I mean child placed in this film to supposedly tug on my heartstrings, makes it out of all this alive. Oh, that poor innocent child. She doesn't deserve this. Welp, I'm on the edge of my seat at this point. Oh, James Cameron, you genius, you. Someone please think of the children. Someone must save the girl first and foremost. That is the mission now for our hero. Eyes roll a full 360 degrees in my head at this point. The little girl screaming got so irritating I wanted nothing more than her to die. There. I said it. Why are the aliens so stationary and dumb in this film? Why are there so many of them all of a sudden? They just keep beelining towards bullets and getting swatted around like flies. Just utter nonsense all around with this overlong piece of expletive sequel. The music slash score is atrocious, with cliché symphonies that you hear in every expletive Spielberg or Michael Bay film, to this very day unfortunately. Whereas the original had a very unique, dark, and mysterious overall score that only added to the amazing atmospheric scenes. This sequel is everything I hate about Hollywood, everything I hate about big blockbuster films, as we are currently experiencing today with superhero films, for example. Just boring, repetitive, dumbed-down, utter trash being passed as great cinema. There are too many negatives I can point out about this film, but I think I've made my point. The original Alien, Ridley Scott's Alien, is one of the greatest films of all time. Aliens is, in my opinion, one of the worst and most boring films I have ever seen. It absolutely blows. Well, I, Skywalking, is not a fan. Not a fan of the concept of this sequel, not a fan of what they did with the Ripley character and why they brought her back, not a fan of the Marines, and most definitely, it seems, not a fan of Newt. There's always going to be the type of fan who loves the first Ridley Scott film and feels the sequel went in the wrong direction, and that's fine, but it is probably rare to see it to such an extreme that's just beyond it not being their taste, but going so far as to being something they absolutely hate in comparison. And I can feel the hate flow through you, young eye skywalking. But agree to disagree, I guess. This reviewer absolutely hates the film, feels it blows, you can't really change their mind. Following along with the seething hatred for the film, we have a review from Jennifer A. Darby from April of 2018, titling this review, Absolute Garbage, with three exclamation points, so you know they're serious. Warning spoilers. This has got to be so far the worst in the series. I am split on this and Alien 3 on which one is worse. First of all, there is a cat. I hate cats. Deal with it. Second is Bill Paxton's worst role in film. I cannot believe they made an embarrassment of the talent he has in this film. It is one of the cheesiest sci-fi movies I have ever seen and I refuse to add it with my Blu-ray collection. The whole time I watched this, I was hoping the cat would get eaten by an alien, but nope. The acting was so cheesy, I thought I was watching a low-budget sci-fi film the whole time. This installment is pure trash and is deaf on my top 10 horrible films of all time. Save your brain and eyes from absorbing this terrible piece of cinema. I am so glad I didn't catch this in theaters as I would demand a refund. All copies of this should be burned, and I would rather watch the Star Wars Holiday Special than endure the time I lost of my life watching this. What on earth was James Cameron thinking? 
there's an odd focus on the cat in this review, which leads me to wonder if this person did in fact actually watch the movie, or maybe got it confused with the first one, or whatever the case may be. Jonesy, of course, the loyal feline to the Nostromo crew, returns briefly to the sequel, but outside of a few scenes in the beginning, Jonesy is completely absent in the film. After 15 minutes or so, Jonesy's gone, he's out of the picture. It's not like Wayland Utani said to Ripley, we need the cat to come too, and he came along to the colony. No, Ripley says it herself, and you, you little shithead, you're staying here. So this reviewer says the whole time they were hoping the cat would get eaten by an alien. So did they reach the halfway point of the movie and realize the cat wasn't going to come back? Were they expecting Jonesy to take his own little ship and fly down there and then get eaten? So strange, this reviewer says they really hate cats, that we should deal with it, but to hate them so much that your blood is just boiling throughout the whole movie, thinking about that damn cat, suggests to me a need for some... self-reflection. There's also a Bill Paxton knock, but we can give it a pass in that respect. They hate the character, not Bill Paxton, and in fact made a point to express how talented he is, so I guess we can forgive it here. But perhaps comparing it to the Star Wars Holiday Special is a little harsh. A great film like Alien should not be in the same breath as something so terrible and misguided, but an exaggeration to make a point, I'm sure. Side note, because I'm curious, how many of you out there actually have seen the Star Wars Holiday Special, and do you think it's as bad as its reputation? Comment below. I personally could never get fully through it, it was way too horrible and boring for me, but let's move on to the next review. This one is titled, What is the Big Deal? by user Netosaurus from March of 2019. Okay, explosions, machine guns, people trapped in a spaceship, and an alien on their pursuit. Seems to me like one of those Friday the 13th movies. What am I missing? And that's it, that's the review. This one really confuses me. It sounds almost like they've mixed up Alien with Aliens. Yet again, I have to wonder if the reviewer actually saw the movie or confused it with the first one. The description almost fits the first, saying it's a single alien on a spaceship, but then also mentions explosions and machine guns. Maybe they watched both Alien and Aliens back to back. Who knows? They also compare it to a Friday the 13th movie, which is also pretty off, though for the record I really enjoy the Friday the 13th series. So I don't really know what to make of this review. What am I missing? This reviewer asks. Well, I think you missed the movie. I'm not even sure they saw it. This next review is from a user named Harry Plinkett 14 This review is from July of 2019, and the title of this review is simply... Evil. This film is outright evil. These are images that belong in hell, and no decent human being should recreate them or watch them. If you do watch it, your soul will suffer. Some very strong words on this film and some very strong beliefs about it, it would seem. If this review and these words on the film seem familiar, then you might actually recall that this user also appeared in the other video featuring one-star reviews of the first film. Similar views and warnings were shared in reference to the first Alien, so here we have Harry Plinkett 14 returning to say much of the same in regard to the sequel. Maybe this person has certain kind of taste when it comes to movies, maybe even a certain set of religious beliefs that would cause him to feel this way, and that's not something I'll poke fun at. I think everyone's entitled to their own religious views, and it's true that certain media may cause offense to those views. However, why would you watch a movie like Alien, then go ahead and watch the sequel Aliens and expect anything different? Seems like common sense to me that you'd get more of the same, and should best avoid it. For what it's worth, I've seen Alien and Aliens probably hundreds of times at this point, and my soul feels just fine. This next review is titled Garbage Movie, from a user named Betty Devs, also from July of 2019. Trash scenes en masse. Stupid marines, a stupid child, many stupid action scenes, and very stupid dialogue en masse. Alien, 1979, from Ridley Scott, is also today great with suspense. But this Aliens garbage movie is really bad. This movie is totally overrated from many stupid fans. Aliens is a movie that won no need. Now, I'm not going to get out the red pen here and go over all the errors and have a good laugh at the reviewer's expense in that way. 
I sort of did that in some reviews of the last video, and I got some comments from people saying, hey, that's a little unfair, not everyone's first language is English, maybe something got lost in translation, and it's a little mean-spirited, and I appreciate that. So, I won't go to that level. However, this reviewer does call us stupid fans, and I take offense to that. We are not stupid fans. We are wonderful people who recognize a great movie that is far from garbage, and we have great taste. A taste, Betty Devs, that you apparently lack. So, let's move right along. This next review is from the user Tales of the Wind. This is actually the one that was duplicated, but both are the same, the only difference being the review title and date. One review is from January 2nd of 2020, with the title Ripley and Shaw were wronged by their writers, they both tripped genocides, and the other from January 17th, titled Lieutenant Ellen Ripley tripped a genocide. So, still generally the same idea, and here's what Tales of the Wind had to say. Warning Spoilers Both Lieutenant Ellen Ripley and Dr. Elizabeth Shaw were written as protagonists and heroes by their writers, but they both actually tripped genocides. Female heroes wronged by their writers. Ripley was celebrated by movie fans for going toe-to-toe -to -toe with company man Carter Burke, who wanted to sneak two alien embryos past quarantine by smuggling them in Ripley's and another character's body while they were in hibernation. Burke was then going to kill the rest of the crew by sabotaging their hibernation units on the trip home. Ripley swore to him she was going to tell the company everything he tried to do, and make sure they nailed him. Right to the wall. The reality is, Carter Burke is actually the hero of the story who would have prevented a genocide. He is the one who sent the family, Newts, out to investigate, and they are the ones that found the spaceship. The spaceship that was filled with hundreds, if not thousands, of eggs. And if this hadn't happened this way, as seen in the movie with the unfortunate number of a few hundred people, the station slash colony would have continued to grow in size with hundreds or thousands more of the human colonists. And eventually, one day, someone would have found that spaceship and those eggs and those hundreds or thousands of humans would all be killed by the aliens. That would have been the genocide, but Carter's greedy actions prevented this eventuality. Carter's the hero. Ripley, our supposed hero, is shouting down the actual hero, threatening to nail him right to the wall for his illegal actions which hadn't even happened yet. So far, he is an innocent man. Once the company that was trying to terraform the planet found out about the aliens and how they had killed a few hundred of their colonists and that there's an alien ship there with thousands more eggs, the company would have quarantined the whole planet and moved on. Although why the original explorers before the terraformers didn't find the spaceship is beyond me. It's apparently really close to base, but I have to let it go. As for Dr. Elizabeth Shaw, she is quite the hero of the story in the movie Prometheus, sole survivor, except for an android, like Ripley tough like Ripley, and she tripped a genocide, just as Ripley had. In a case of profound misjudgment, she chose to actually believe that the homicidal android she needed to fly her off the planet would get her safely to the next destination. She did this out of selfishness. I want to know where they came from. She should have stayed and died on the planet. Not only was she stunningly unable to correct her errors, but she probably wasn't even aware that the smiling David android we see in the next movie, Alien Covenant, flushed the gorgeous green planet below with death and doom causing genocide to its humanoids. Or, as the name we've come to know them as, the Engineers. But it wasn't just the Engineers. David killed every single animal on the entire planet. Untold ecological billions died and left landmines to kill any living thing that might visit the beautiful planet in the future. And he killed Shaw. For such a smart protagonist, the writers sure made her bafflingly stupid. At the end of the movie, David has commandeered another spaceship filled with thousands of hibernating colonists. A very smart female captain, a new identity, fresh alien eggs, and he's still wildly homicidal. That's still Dr. Shaw's fault. She literally put his head back on his body, got into an alien ship with him and took off, where she should have just stayed and died on that planet. Or had better writers. These female heroes were wronged by their writers. Am I the only one who sees this? I swear you find some very interesting oddities in these one-star reviews. Here the author muses on ideas not just presented by aliens, but by Ridley Scott's prequel films. I see what they're trying to say, at least I think I do. The film offers us some strong female characters, but this reviewer seems to feel they were betrayed by the writers in having them inadvertently contribute to genocides. 
or possible genocides, and seems to feel Carter Burke ultimately comes out as the hero. I think this reviewer misinterprets the intentions of Wayland yutani in many ways. But the reviewer obviously feels strongly about their stance, not only in posting this review twice for Aliens, but also posting this review in one-star user reviews for Prometheus and Alien Covenant as well. So, clearly, they take enough issue with this particular perceived offense, enough to rate three separate movies with one star, and to repeat this same review technically four times over. Interpret all of this however you wish. This next review is from February of this year, from a user named Landine underscore Jacob. The review title, Terrible. Let's see what Landine underscore Jacob finds so terrible. This movie is hot trash. I finished watching it with a friend because he had to finish it, and I watched the last 15 minutes of it. It was probably the worst graphics, the worst logic, and painful to watch. I don't know if I can ever recover. Even Sesame Street is better. So if I understand this reviewer's accounts correctly, they only watched the last 15 minutes of it. Is that right? I'm not sure, but clearly those 15 minutes were not especially impressive to this reviewer. They claim Sesame Street is better. Hey, nothing wrong with Sesame Street, it's a perfectly fine program, but I don't see how you can really make a comparison. I mean, yeah, I get it, they're saying a program for children is better compared to it, so substitute Sesame Street with Barney or Paw Patrol, haha, <laughs> really funny. Landine underscore Jacob claims they're not sure if they'll ever be able to recover after experiencing that 15 minutes of the film. Well, hang in there, Landine underscore Jacob, I wish you well. My thoughts and prayers go out to you. I hope nothing for you than a speedy recovery and a return to normalcy, whatever that may be. The next and final review is from Jack Jeebs, 5276, and the title is Way Overrated. This is from August 2020, just a few months ago, so let's see what they had to say. Compared to Alien, Aliens is just a glorified sci-fi channel movie. Gone is all the mystery that made the first movie one of the greatest science fiction and horror films of all time. A short and sweet review. To the point, and maybe fair enough. There are plenty of people evident here and elsewhere who love the first film, think it's a masterpiece, one of the greatest sci-fi horror films ever made, but feel Aliens just doesn't live up to it. And that's fine. I've heard from lots of people who do feel that way, and they're perfectly reasonable about it, and everyone's entitled to their own tastes. I guess it's just slapping that one-star rating on it that I take issue with. Even if you feel it is inferior, is it really worth just one star? When you think about a one-star rating, the absolute lowest you could possibly rate a movie on this site, you think more towards the absolute worst movies of all time. The irredeemable, the awful, the totally incompetently made. Aliens, of course, is nowhere near that. Even a movie in the series I do hate, like Aliens vs. Predator Requiem, I wouldn't rate it a 1 or call it one of the worst films of all time. There are at least some redeeming factors, no matter how scarce they may be. At least maybe a 3 or 4, I guess. But that's just the thing, it's just a number at the end of it all. Some feel the need to justify it, some don't, some exaggerate, some just want to tip its rating down for spite. Maybe they have another movie on the top 250 that they'd rather see above Aliens. It's just how it works. Welcome to the internet. But that's it. These are the one-star rating reviews from IMDb for James Cameron's Aliens. It's a very different movie from the first, and the negative reviews are also very different. A lot of the criticisms this time around are of the dialogue, the action, and just not seeming to match up with the first movie. Again, I personally don't think these complaints should warrant a one-star rating, but these reviewers have decided to vote that way. Whether or not you agree with the rating either, I have to ask, do you agree with any of the points made here? Do any of the criticisms ring true to one degree or another? Comment below and let me know what you think. As always, I'd like to thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it, and I hope you had some fun going through these one-star reviews. And if you enjoyed the video, please make sure to give it a like. And you can also subscribe for all the latest videos from the channel. My very, very special thanks goes out to William Dutani Executives, Emurek, Mark Fox, and in the Ellen Ripley tier of excellence, Lady Anne. My thanks also goes out to the Hive Queens, Ronnie Jensen, Alice Sane, and Jackson Roche, all part of the Patreon Hive. If you'd like to join the Hive and support the channel, check out my Patreon page for exclusive posts and contests. In the meantime, you can catch up with Alien Theory over social media, 
Follow at alien underscore theory on Twitter and at alien theory YT on Facebook and Instagram for more. And until next time, this is Alien Theory, signing off. <laughs>